shell and tube. The most basic and the most common type of heat exchanger construction is the shell and tube. This type of heat exchanger consists of a set of tubes in a container called a shell. The fluid flowing inside the tubes is called the tube side fluid and the fluid flowing on the outside of the tubes is the shell side fluid. At the end of the tubes, the tube side fluid is separated from the shell side fluid by the tube sheets. The tubes are rolled and press fitted or welded into the tube sheet to provide a leak tight seal. So the shell and tube type heat exchanger is essentially a series of pipes that will pass through a heat exchanger and we'll have one medium flowing through the pipes and one medium flowing on the outside of the pipes. And we're going to have a look at an example in a moment. In systems where the two fluids are at vastly different pressures, the higher pressure fluid is typically directed through the tubes and the lower pressure fluid is circulated on the shell side. This is due to economy because the heat exchanger tubes can be made to withstand higher pressures than the shell of the heat exchanger for a much lower cost. The support plates shown below act as baffles to direct the flow of fluid within the shell back and forth across the tubes. So what we mean here is when we are pumping a fluid or a medium through a heat exchanger, the medium at a higher pressure is going to go through the tubes. Sometimes if you have two mediums such as oil and water, where the water is cooling down the oil, it may be very important that the oil does not leak out into the water. This is especially true if we're using something like river water or lake water to cool down the oil. We don't want oil leaking out through the tubes and going back into the river or the lake or even the ocean. So what we'll do, we'll have what they call a double walled tube and we will have a tube that has two walls and if oil was to leak out of the inner wall of the tube, it will go into the middle between the outer and the inner wall and it will set off a leak alarm. So that way we know that one of the tubes is leaking and we have an alarm but it doesn't leak out directly into the shell and into the water. Let's just load up a model here so I can show you in more detail how the heat exchanger works. Okay, so here we have a standard shell and tube heat exchanger. I'll just do a little spin. We can see there's two pipes on the top and two pipes on the bottom. We've got a stand and that is for installing the heat exchanger. Just do a spin around this side. We can see the nuts and bolts on the end here. We will undo those to open up the end cover and get inside the heat exchanger or do an inspection or maintenance. Just take a cross section. Okay, so we've got a cross section now of the heat exchanger. We can see here tube side fluid out tube side fluid in. When we say tube side, we mean the medium that is flowing through the tubes. The opposite of tube side is shell side. We'll have shell side fluid in and shell side fluid out. That is this lower section here or the lower pipe. Right, let's get to an overview so we can follow the flow through the heat exchanger. Okay, so we have got a cold fluid flowing in from the bottom. It is then flowing along through the heat exchanger, through these tubes. It is doing a U-turn. This is actually called a U-turn shell and tube type heat exchanger. A U-turn here and then it is flowing back that way and it is coming out of the top. Let me just spin around this side. We can see the entrance points and we can see there are the tubes and the tubes are going off into the distance. So the fluid is going to be flowing directly into these tubes. We can also see a plate which is used for separating the fluid as it flows in from the bottom and then out of the top. So if we were to move this plate or take it out, we would actually just have a fluid that flows in from the bottom and directly out the top. It's going to choose the path of least resistance. But because the plate's there, it's coming in and flowing through the bottom tubes and we'll just follow it along. 
along these tubes and we can see here this is where it suddenly turns around it's coming all traveling to the right on the lower section around the tubes around this u-turn and back the other way and it's going to keep going all the way until it comes out of the top again or the top section of the heat exchanger what's actually happened is it's gone in the bottom out of the top and it has absorbed some of that heat and it's then going to take away that heat and distribute it somewhere else perhaps to ambient air or perhaps it would just go back to a reservoir sometimes they'll even use some of the warmer fluid for a later stage in the process it's a good way to recycle the heat rather than just waste it because essentially when you're removing the heat that is a efficiency or an energy loss so if you can use it earlier or later in the process again you're recovering some of that energy and you're increasing the process efficiency. Let's have a look at the fluid that comes in at the top. The shell side fluid in, in at the top. Now it does not, unlike the tubular flow, which flows relatively direct, the fluid that is flowing in on the shell side is going to flow around a series of baffle plates. It's going to come around here and be forced to turn. It's going to turn again, it's going to turn again, and it's going to keep doing that all the way along and then it is going to exit at the bottom of the heat exchanger. I have to say it would be slightly better if this uh, discharge port from the heat exchanger was more to the right in order that it could flow through the heat exchanger and down on the right hand side rather than here but that is how the heat exchanger has been built in 3D here. The reason for this crisscrossing pattern, this is actually called cross flow, is because we want to maximize the heat transfer between the two flowing fluids. And we do this by having a cross flow pattern. There's no point the fluid entering in the top, flowing directly here and then dropping out of the bottom, because if we do it like that, we've had very little turbulent flow, and there's not going to be as much heat transfer between the two mediums compared to when we do this cross flow pattern. And although you can't actually see it, inside these tubes, there is normally a thin piece of copper or plastic, and it will slide into each and every one of these tubes. Now this thin piece of copper, or perhaps plastic or other form of metal, it depends on the system that you're actually using it for, is similar to a very thin strip a flat bar, a thin flat bar of copper, for example. And the idea is that as the fluid is flowing through the tubes, it does not get to flow in a straight laminar direction. It is going to come into contact with this thin perforated copper bar, and then it is going to be forced to flow over and under the copper bar. In other words, it's going to have a very, very turbulent path through the tubes. And this is what we want. We want turbulent flow because this is going to increase our heat transfer. The other benefit with turbulent flow is simply that if we have suspended bodies within the fluid that may stick to the sides of the tubes, they won't be able to stick to the sides of the tubes as easily. If they do stick to the sides of the tubes, that is going to reduce our heat transfer rate or our heat transfer capacity. So by having this turbulent flow, we're preventing them or reducing the risk that they're going to be able to stick to the sides of the tubes. And this will maintain our heat transfer capacity. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about things sticking to the sides or surfaces of a heat exchanger, go and have a look at your kettle. Now, if you boil your kettle a thousand times using standard tap water, it's very likely you'll notice a thin white powdery substance building up within the kettle. Now this is actually reducing your heat transfer. This white powdery substance comes from the water itself, the minerals and suspended bodies within the water. And over time, it will stick to the inside metal surfaces of your kettle and it will reduce the heat transfer rate. And that's exactly what can also happen in a heat exchanger. Another example is a boiler. With boilers, they go to great lengths to ensure that the water quality is as clean as possible. 
And the reason, again, is that any suspended bodies that stick to the surface of the boiler tubes will reduce the heat transfer rate. And in severe conditions, this can actually cause the piping to melt. So it's very important that you keep the contact surface areas within your heat exchanger as clean as possible. So that is a U-type shell and tube heat exchanger. If we were to click here, we could actually have a look at some of the more specific pieces. For example, let's just have a look at the tubes. And we can see our tubes. If I do a full version again, we can see all of our tubes there and the way they are installed. We can also highlight the baffles. And the baffles now are shown. And we'll see our flow comes in and around the baffles like so. So the baffles, if I just highlight them for you, are those pieces here. And they'll be designed to be installed in this pattern so that we get this cross flow. If that was all a bit quick, don't worry. We are going to go through this in more detail later in the course with some different examples. I just think that was a nice introduction to what a shell and tube type heat exchanger is. Now let's go on to the next lesson.